We welcome you to the third Sunday after Epiphany, and we hope that you will enjoy our worship service here at Zion. We'll begin with our brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken system that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongue, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace! Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you.
us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Jonah, chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. trust and exhortation, in robbery take no empty pride. O wealth increase, let not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God. That fast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their deeds. God alone is my rock and my salvation. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 
time was fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter beginning with the 14th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, sons of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. What would you do if you knew you only had 40 more days to live? Now this question isn't meant to be depressing. The question is meant to have you step back and realize that life can sometimes throw you a curveball. It can happen to anyone. Doctors' visits can give you very unexpected news, and it can make you rethink your life and what the future may hold. You may question things like, how many days do I have left before the pain gets too great? Or how many more days do I have before I find myself limited and unable to do the things I love to do? When we receive such news, it is easy to find ourselves thinking of our past. Back to that day when we could drive without limitations or work those extra hours without too many problems. It always seems as if life was good or at least easier back then. But besides looking back at our past, we start thinking about our future. We wonder, well, how are we going to cope with all these new concerns in our lives? We might find ourselves becoming angry that we have to deal with such issues. What have we done to deserve them? Or we might find ourselves becoming numb and worried with pain and anxiety. Let me get back again to what I just said at the beginning, that question. What would you do if you were given exactly 40 days to live? How would you live out those days? Would you get busy living or busy dying? Would you make the most out of your 40 days, or would you just lie down and wait for the 40 days to pass by? There are those out there that would look at a situation like that and see it as a second chance. Over the years, I have ministered to many people who knew they were going to die fairly soon and who took that diagnosis as sort of a wake-up call. I've seen people work on their relationships that were broken, hoping to mend them and leave the world without regrets. I've seen people who suddenly begin to reevaluate their faith and their relationship with the Lord and try to become right with God. And of course, there are people out there that would do something like create a bucket list of things they want to do before they die. Overall, I'm guessing that most of us would just get busy living with what we had left of our lives. Yet when God gives us the great and terrible news that our sin is destroying our relationship with God, what do we do then? Do we get busy living for God, or do we get busy dying for our sins? And what if God just gave us 40 days to get rid of all of our sins? What would we do? Would we work on writing our relationship with God, or would we live a wild life and wait until the last possible minute to get rid of those sins that haunt our souls? Now, the answer to those questions really depend on how you view sin. Not everybody views sin the same. Some believe, for instance, that there are different levels of sin. One they might call mortal sins that impair your soul. Others, venial sins that aren't as bad as mortal sins. Others think God looks at sin and then ranks sin in, in its severity. Murder, for example, would be worse than talking back to your parents, and so on. 
But that isn't how it works in God's eyes. To God, sin is sin. That means just one sin is enough to keep you from a relationship with God. Just one sin is enough to cast you eternally into the pit of despair. God's task, therefore, is to help us see just how much God hates sin and how much God is willing to do to destroy it. That is one of the reasons why our Old Testament reading from Jonah still has so much weight for us today. We have an opportunity to go back to time and look at Jonah and his encounter with the Ninevites. The book of Jonah not only gives us an example of how much God hates sins and loves the sinner, but what God is willing to do to save God's creation from sin. Our Old Testament reading for today is just a small portion of Jonah's call to go to Nineveh and tell them of their impending doom unless they repent. You probably know what has happened before Jonah in our reading, but I'm going to just give you a little short synopsis. Jonah has been called by God to go to Nineveh and ask them to repent of their sins or they will be destroyed. Jonah doesn't want to do that. He thinks God's grace is too good. And so he decides to take a ship and go in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He then ends up being thrown off the ship and swallowed by a whale and spit up on a shore. It ends up being a very harsh lesson to Jonah that he should pay attention to what God tells him to do. Now finally Jonah has given in to God's command and he goes to Nineveh to do God's will. The problem is that he still doesn't want to do it. Jonah is afraid that God's grace is going to save these sinful people. So instead, Jonah wants God to punish the people of Nineveh. But as Jonah arrives, which is what we are read, it, read in our portion of Jonah for today, he receives the word from God and he goes out to speak to the people of Nineveh. He goes around the town saying, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yes, an eight-word message is given, and I'm sure you would all just rejoice if all I would give was an eight-word sermon, but unfortunately that's not going to happen. So he goes around saying, 40 more days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The law of God has spoken to the Ninevites. The people of Nineveh were wicked, and now they needed to behave and to repent. The problem is that um, Jonah is afraid they will repent, that they will behave. And that's where we come to in our lesson, is that God gave the Ninevites 40 days to change their life. And in those 40 days, they could continue to live the way they had lived, or they could change their ways. And that's when a miracle occurs. In the same way we see the power of God in action in a man called Saul, who condemned Christians and was transformed into Paul, who became a martyr for the Christ. Here we see an entire city take God at God's word. God gave them a second chance, and the Ninevites collectively began to see God for who God truly was, the one true God that hates sin. The Ninevites, who were pagans, enemies of Israel, now were being changed into people longing for repentance and hope. The book of Jonah tells us when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made to Nineveh. The king took God at God's word, and he literally was moved into turning away from his old life. He chose right away to live for God. The king even says, all shall turn away from their evil ways and from the violence that is at their hand. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Even without a promise from God that God would relent, the Ninevites were willing to humble themselves before the Lord. Now what does this action teach us? We learn from the Ninevites to repent, to turn away from our sins and see the true holiness of God. God changes lives. God hates sin and longs for his people to turn away from sin and turn towards the holiness of the mercy of our Lord. Sin is what separates each of us from God. Sin is there like a wall that is so tall that you can never scale it on your own. 
With the help of God, you not only get a way to climb over that wall, you get a way to break through that wall with Jesus Christ. In Christ, our sins are forgiven, and we are made whole again and given a clean slate. The good news for us is that unlike the Ninevites who prayed that God might forgive them, we have Jesus who offers us no doubt. We do not have to think for one moment that if we fail to confess every sin that we will somehow lose the opportunity to receive our eternal reward because we know God has through Christ forgiven us of all of our sins. But even with the knowledge of Christ's forgiveness, we still need to evaluate our lives. For by hating sin the way God hates sin and by casting our sins at the feet of Christ, and seeking his mercy and grace, we are showing ourselves that our love for God is way more than lip service. We also need to remind ourselves that if God only gave us 40 days to live, we would not hesitate to get busy to living for God instead of living for our own selfishness. For years, the Ninevites had lived the way they wanted to live without really understanding the consequences of sin. Only when they learned that their sin would destroy them in a 40-day countdown did the Ninevites wake up. Sometimes we Christians lose sight of how deadly sin really is or just how much God hates sin. Maybe that's why so often people turn away from church or studying God's words because they no longer believe sin is as bad as we, God says it is. God, however, does not give up on those folks, even as he didn't give up on the people of Nineveh in Jonah's day. God continues to speak to us about the dangers of sin and his desire to give us a second chance. You remember do-overs in grade school, don't you? Or elementary school, whatever they called it when you were a kid. When I was a kid, a do-over was when you could say you were playing basketball or something and it went really bad. You could say, do-over, and you could try that shot again. And nothing would matter. You could start over again. Well, in a way, we live in a constant do-over in our lives. God daily gives us a dose of do-overs because of Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you, therefore, to take time out and give thanks to Almighty God that each morning we can open our eyes and see that day as a total do-over, a day where we can look at, to God more today than we did yesterday, when we can repent our sins more today than we did yesterday, and we can long for God's word more today than we did yesterday. Who knows? Maybe we would, should start writing down our own bucket lists, but not one of things we want to do before we die, instead of things that God would want us to do. Who knows? We might just have 40 more days left of life. If that's the case, I'm encouraging all of us to do more with God's word and to keep busy living for Jesus instead of getting busy living for ourselves. Get busy to die to your old nature, your old habits, and everything that is contrary to the will of God. And if you need an encouragement, just remember how wide the eyes of the Ninevites were opened when they were given the same opportunity by our Lord. Amen.
Let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, for nonprofit and non-governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcasts and all who await relief, especially for those who have been affected by the coronavirus, that in the midst of all suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, and for the organizations that meet here during the week, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors, in the faith and whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, 
Hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all, and also with you. Please share the peace with those who gather with you watching our service today. Let us pray, O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child, with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care, and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen.
Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.